First Story by Mark Reynolds I can still feel the adrenaline pumping through my veins as I recount the night I ventured into the decaying heart of an abandoned asylum. It was a chilly October evening in Portland, Oregon, and my curiosity had finally gotten the better of me. I'd always been drawn to urban exploration, but I'd never encountered anything like this before. The old Hartfield Asylum had been abandoned for decades, its towering silhouette haunting the outskirts of the city. Rumors circulated that it was a place of unspeakable horrors during its operational years, but I dismissed them as mere urban legends. Armed with my flashlight and a group of like-minded explorers, I set out to unravel the mysteries shrouding the asylum. As the sun dipped below the horizon, the atmosphere grew more ominous. The building loomed in front of us, a sprawling complex with its windows shattered and walls crumbling. We approached it cautiously, a feeling of unease gnawing at my insides. The sense of foreboding only intensified as we stepped inside. The lobby greeted us with shattered glass and decaying furniture, bathed in a silvery moonlight. The air was heavy with the smell of decay, and my flashlight's beam cut through the oppressive darkness. Our footsteps echoed through the desolation as we ventured deeper into the asylum. Odd graffiti marked the walls, disturbing symbols that seemed to pulse with malevolence. But that wasn't the strangest part. As we delved further into the building, we began to hear faint whispers, distant and indecipherable. The source remained elusive, and my heart raced. We reached a long, dimly lit corridor, and the feeling of being watched descended upon us. The walls were lined with doors to former patient rooms, some ajar, and others still shut. Behind one of those closed doors, I heard a low, guttural moan. We froze, glancing at each other in alarm. In the dim light, I made out a message scrawled in red paint on the wall. They never left. My skin prickled with a sudden chill, and it felt like the temperature dropped several degrees. We knew we had to continue, despite the growing unease. The further we went, the more we sensed that something was amiss. The eerie silence was broken by the occasional echoing footsteps, as if someone, or something, was tailing us. We quickened our pace, eager to explore this unholy place and escape its grasp. In one room, we stumbled upon an unsettling scene. A circle of candles flickered in the middle of the floor, their wax forming grotesque patterns. A pentagram was etched into the wooden planks, and a torn book lay open beside it. The book was filled with incantations, conjuring spells, and disturbing drawings. The atmosphere grew oppressive, and the walls seemed to close in on us. At that moment, we heard footsteps approaching from the hallway. Panic washed over us as we scrambled to put out the candles and hide in the room's shadows. The footsteps drew nearer, growing louder with each passing second. My heart pounded like a drum in my chest as we braced for an encounter with an unknown intruder. The figure that emerged from the shadows was a tall, haggard man in tattered clothes. His wild, unkempt beard and hollow eyes sent shivers down my spine. He muttered incomprehensible words and appeared to be reenacting a ritual, moving from candle to candle. The stench of rot and decay emanated from him, and we couldn't help but recoil in fear. It was then that we realized we were in danger and the man's intent was unclear. We knew we had to escape. As we silently retreated from the room, one of my friends accidentally knocked over a small object, causing a loud clatter. The man's head snapped in our direction, his eyes locking onto us with a manic intensity. We didn't wait to see what he would do next. We bolted down the corridor, retracing our steps through the dark, labyrinth and asylum. The whispers grew louder, more distinct, and filled with a dreadful anticipation. 
It was as though the very walls were mocking our escape, urging us to return to the clutches of the madman. The adrenaline-fueled sprint brought us to the asylum's main entrance. We burst out into the crisp night, the taste of freedom sweet on our lips. It wasn't until we were safely outside, under the moonlit sky, that we finally caught our breath. The experience left a lasting imprint on my soul. The asylum was a place where the boundary between the living and the dead blurred, where unspeakable rituals were conducted, and where the darkness had taken hold. To this day, I can't shake the feeling that we narrowly escaped something far more sinister than mere deranged explorers like ourselves. The Hartfield Asylum had more secrets than we could ever fathom, and I could never forget the chilling whispers that echoed through its decaying halls. Second Story by Emily Carter It was a rainy November evening in the heart of Cleveland, Ohio. The city's industrial past was riddled with stories of abandoned factories, and I found myself drawn to one in particular. The old Halcyon manufacturing plant, a colossal, rusting relic of the past, had always piqued my curiosity. The factory was situated in an eerie part of town, its presence casting an ominous shadow over the derelict streets. A group of friends and I had heard rumors about strange occurrences within its decaying walls, and we were determined to uncover the truth. Armed with flashlights and a sense of adventure, we set off for what promised to be a thrilling urban exploration. As we entered the factory, the pungent smell of rust and dampness engulfed us. The interior was a sprawling maze of rusted machinery, broken windows, and forgotten assembly lines. We treaded carefully over debris-strewn floors as we made our way further into the factory. The ominous silence was only broken by the echoing drips of rainwater leaking through the roof. There was an air of unease, a constant feeling of being watched. Shadows danced at the periphery of our flashlight beams, playing tricks on our eyes. The sense of dread intensified as we ventured deeper, and we couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone. Amid the echoes of our footsteps, we began to hear faint, muffled voices in the distance. At first, we assumed they were the sounds of distant city life, but as we progressed, the voices grew more distinct and unsettling. It was as if a group of people were whispering to each other, plotting something sinister in the shadows. We cautiously followed the whispers to a dimly lit chamber filled with dilapidated crates and barrels. A strange symbol, an inverted cross entwined with serpents, was painted on the wall. Our flashlights revealed a collection of disturbing photographs scattered on the floor. The pictures depicted people in various stages of distress and torture. Fear gripped us as we realized that we had stumbled upon something truly disturbing. Just as we were about to leave the room, the whispers suddenly stopped, and a cold breeze rushed through the chamber, extinguishing our flashlights. Panic set in as we fumbled in the dark, struggling to relight them. Then we heard a guttural voice from the corner, so close it sent shivers down our spines. Welcome, the voice hissed, and we felt an icy hand graze our faces. We recoiled, finally managing to illuminate the room again. Standing before us was a man clad in a tattered, blood-stained cloak, his face obscured by a grotesque mask. He held a knife that glistened malevolently in the weak light. The man stepped closer, his voice laced with madness. He spoke of rituals, of sacrifices made to appease some dark entity that resided within the factory. It was clear that he believed we had intruded upon their sanctuary, and we were now to be a part of their sinister ceremony. With trembling hands, we backed away from the man, our hearts pounding like war drums. It was a race against time to escape the factory, and the madness that dwelled within. We turned and fled, guided only by the feeble beams of our flashlights. 
The man's deranged laughter echoed through the dark corridors, sending chills down our spines. The voices grew louder, more sinister, urging us to return to the horrors of the Halcyon manufacturing plant. But we pressed on, our fear propelling us to reach the exit. Finally, we burst out into the rain-soaked streets, our bodies drenched, and our souls shaken. The rain washed away the fear, but the memories lingered, haunting us to this day. The Halcyon manufacturing plant was more than an abandoned factory. It was a place where dark rituals and sinister whispers thrived, and where the line between reality and nightmare blurred. That night, as we huddled together in the safety of our homes, we couldn't help but wonder what might have happened if we hadn't managed to escape that dreadful place. The secrets of the factory would forever remain a mystery but the memories of that chilling encounter would stay with us, a constant reminder that some places are best left in the darkness. Third Story by David Bennett I never thought that a seemingly ordinary storm drain beneath the streets of New York City could harbor such terrifying secrets, but the events of that fateful night still haunt my every waking moment. It was a crisp autumn evening, and a sense of adventure took hold of me as I found myself with a small group of urban explorers. We had all heard rumors of a hidden underground network beneath the city streets, a place few dared to venture. Armed with flashlights and an eagerness to unravel the mysteries below, we decided to descend into the unknown. Our entry point was an unassuming storm drain beneath a graffiti-covered bridge in Brooklyn. The graffiti only intensified the sense of urban decay surrounding us as we ventured into the darkness. The pungent smell of dampness enveloped us, and the sound of rushing water echoed through the tunnels. The initial excitement quickly faded as we navigated the labyrinthine passages. The air grew thick and suffocating and the echoing footsteps of my companions added to the growing unease. It was as if the tunnels themselves were closing in on us, conspiring to trap us within their claustrophobic grip. We reached a fork in the tunnel, and an eerie sound caught our attention. It was a faint, mournful melody, like a child humming a haunting tune. The sound was distant, echoing through the narrow passageways. We followed it, our curiosity pushing us forward despite our growing trepidation. The music led us to a chamber, dimly lit by flickering candles. In the center of the room was a crude altar, adorned with cryptic symbols and a collection of decaying dolls. The melody was coming from a gramophone that played on its own, its needle dancing across an old, warped record. The entire scene felt like something out of a horror movie, and our pulses quickened. As we examined the room, a subtle whispering filled the air. The words were incoherent, spoken in a hushed tone. We couldn't locate the source, and it felt as though the very walls of the chamber were murmuring secrets to us. A cold breeze brushed against our skin, making us shiver. Our sense of dread escalated when a woman suddenly appeared from the shadows. She was dressed in ragged clothing, her hair wild and matted. Her eyes were vacant, yet they seemed to pierce through our very souls. She approached the altar, her movements slow and deliberate, and began to sing the eerie melody in a language we couldn't understand. Fear gripped us as we realized that we had stumbled upon something beyond our comprehension. The woman's song grew louder, and the whispers in the room intensified as if they were responding to her. We knew we had to leave, but the fear of alerting her kept us rooted to the spot. Just as we were about to make a hasty retreat, the woman abruptly stopped singing and turned her gaze toward us. Her eyes locked onto mine, and a sinister smile twisted her lips. In that moment, we knew we were in grave danger. Without hesitation, we turned and sprinted back through the dark tunnels, leaving the chilling chamber behind. The echoes of the woman's laughter followed us, 
reverberating through the winding passageways. The tunnel seemed endless, and the fear of becoming lost in the subterranean maze gnawed at our minds. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, we emerged into the cool night air, gasping for breath. The storm drain had seemingly transformed into a portal to a realm of nightmares. We never spoke of what we had encountered to anyone, and the memory of that subterranean encounter has stayed with me like a dark stain on my soul. To this day, I cannot pass by a storm drain in the city without feeling a shiver down my spine, wondering what other horrors might lie beneath the streets of New York, hidden in the underground labyrinth of darkness. Fourth Story by Michael Anderson it was a warm summer evening in the sleepy town of Clifton, nestled deep within the Appalachian Mountains. My friends and I had a fascination with exploring abandoned places, and our latest adventure led us to the decaying Clifton Theater. The town's people had long avoided the place, citing strange occurrences and unexplained phenomena. The theater was a relic from the past, its marquee faded and its once grand facade now crumbling. We couldn't resist the allure of its forgotten glory, and with a set of flashlights, we set out to unravel the mysteries that lay within. As we entered the building, a heavy silence greeted us. The musty smell of old velvet seats and decaying wood hung in the air. The main theater hall was a grand sight, even in its dilapidated state with faded red curtains still hanging on the stage. We explored the space, our footsteps echoing through the cavernous hall. It was as we climbed the winding stairwell to the upper levels that we heard a distant, eerie sound. It was the faint, melancholic tune of a music box, playing the melody that tugged at our heartstrings. Our steps faltered as we strained to identify the source, but it remained elusive. The sound led us to a small, forgotten room tucked away in the corner of the theater. Inside, we found a weathered music box on a dusty table, its delicate ballerina figurine twirling to the haunting melody. The tune had a familiarity, as if it were from a distant memory, yet none of us could place it. As we puzzled over the music box, the room grew cold, and a chill raced down our spines. We knew we had to leave, but the eerie melody continued to play, echoing in our ears as we made our way back to the main hall. It was there that we encountered something even more unsettling. In the dim light, we saw a shadowy figure seated in the theater's once grand seats. They were motionless, their features obscured in darkness, and they emitted an aura of silent, sorrowful contemplation. Terrified, we turned to leave, but the theater had other plans. The exit door refused to budge, trapping us inside. Panic set in as we struggled to force the door open. The figures in the seats remained silent but seemed to watch our futile efforts. Just as we began to despair, the music box's melody changed. The once mournful tune transformed into a menacing crescendo and the figures in the seats stood up. Their movements were unnatural, as if they were puppeteered by some malevolent force. In the dim light, we could see that their eyes were hollow and empty. The figures advanced on us, their silent approach filled with menace. We fought against the paralyzing fear that had taken hold, finally managing to force the door open and escape into the night. We never spoke of that night to anyone, and the memory of the Clifton Theater haunts my dreams. The place was more than just an abandoned building. It was a theater of the macabre, where the spirits of a forgotten audience were forever trapped, and a malevolent force orchestrated a sinister performance. The eerie music box's melody still lingers in my mind, a reminder of the mysteries we left behind in that forsaken place. Fifth Story by Sarah Matthews As a student in Chicago, 
I often found myself drawn to the city's rich history and enigmatic architecture. It was during one of my urban explorations that I stumbled upon the Sterling Heights apartment complex, a towering structure that loomed over the city's south side. Its faded exterior and boarded-up windows hinted at a dark past, and the rumors surrounding the complex were enough to send chills down anyone's spine. Intrigued by the possibility of uncovering hidden secrets, I enlisted a few adventurous friends, and we made our way to the foreboding building on a chilly winter night. The wind howled around us as we approached, and the eerie silence that enveloped the complex was broken only by the distant hum of the city. The interior was a maze of narrow corridors and dimly lit stairwells. The air was heavy with a musty, stale odor, and the sound of our footsteps echoed through the desolate hallways. It felt as if the very walls were whispering secrets to us, urging us to delve deeper into the mysteries that lay within. It was on the fourth floor that we encountered something truly unsettling. A door creaked open as we passed by, revealing a shadowy figure standing in the darkness. The figure's eyes gleamed in the dim light, and a sense of dread settled over us. We froze, unsure whether to approach or flee. The figure stepped forward, revealing itself to be a disheveled man muttering incoherently. His gaze darted around the hallway, and we could sense a palpable sense of madness in his demeanor. We tried to communicate with him, but his words were disjointed and made no sense. It was as if he was lost in some alternate reality, detached from the world around him. As we continued our exploration, strange occurrences became more frequent. Doors slammed shut on their own, and faint whispers seemed to follow us from room to room. The temperature dropped inexplicably, and the feeling of being watched never left us. In one of the deserted apartments, we discovered a makeshift shrine adorned with decaying flowers and candles. The flickering flames cast eerie shadows on the walls and the stale air was laden with the scent of decay. We couldn't shake the feeling that we had intruded upon something sacred, something that should have remained undisturbed. Our nerves were already frayed when we stumbled upon a hidden staircase leading down to the basement. The steps were worn and uneven, and the air grew colder with each descent. The flickering light of our flashlights revealed a subterranean labyrinth, its walls lined with faded graffiti and cryptic symbols. It was then that we heard a series of blood-curdling screams echoing through the darkness. The sounds were guttural and filled with a deep, primal terror. We exchanged panicked glances, our hearts pounding in our chests. The screams seemed to reverberate from every corner of the basement, surrounding us with a suffocating sense of dread. Without hesitation, we raced back up the stairs, the desperate cries still ringing in our ears. We burst out into the frigid night, gasping for air and clinging to each other for support. The Sterling Heights apartment complex held secrets far darker than we could have imagined, and the memory of that night serves as a chilling reminder that some places are best left undisturbed, lest they awaken forces beyond our comprehension. Sixth Story by Jonathan Ellis Nestled in the deep woods of Massachusetts, the abandoned Thistledown Mill had always been a source of fascination and dread for those who knew of its existence. It was said that strange occurrences plagued the decaying structure, and tales of a cursed past had kept even the bravest souls at bay. One summer evening, my curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to uncover the truth. I set out with a small group of friends, equipped with flashlights and a sense of adventure that quickly waned as we entered the dense, whispering forest surrounding the mill. The setting sun cast long, eerie shadows that seemed to beckon us into the heart of darkness. The air was thick with the scent of damp earth and the distant rustle of leaves, as if nature itself warned us to turn back. The mill loomed before us, 
an imposing structure with broken windows and crumbling walls. We cautiously made our way inside, our flashlights revealing an interior that had succumbed to the ravages of time. The sound of our footsteps echoed through the cavernous space, amplifying the oppressive silence. As we ventured deeper into the mill, we heard faint whispers that seemed to emanate from the very walls themselves. The voices were hushed, indecipherable, and sent a shiver down our spines. It was as if the very structure held the secrets of its cursed past, and it sought to share them with us. We followed the whispers through a maze of narrow corridors until we reached a small, dimly lit chamber. In the center of the room was a collection of bizarre, old-fashioned dolls arranged in a circle. Their glassy eyes stared at us with an unsettling intensity, and a sense of foreboding filled the air. The room felt strangely colder, and a sudden gust of wind extinguished our flashlights. Panic set in as we fumbled to relight them. The whispers grew louder, more pronounced, and seemed to come from all directions. It was as if the very shadows were conspiring against us, urging us to stay and uncover the mill's dark secrets. Then, the dolls in the room began to move on their own. Their limbs twitched and their heads turned, their glassy eyes following our every move. It was a sight straight out of a nightmare, and we could hardly believe our eyes. The whispers intensified, as if the dolls themselves were speaking to us in their ghostly, incoherent language. We knew we had to escape the room and the mill itself. With trembling hands, we made our way back to the entrance. But the heavy wooden door refused to budge. It was as if the mill had come to life, locking us inside its cursed grasp. The whispers became more frantic, and the doll's movements grew increasingly erratic. It was as if they were trying to convey a message, one we were too terrified to comprehend. Desperation took hold as we fought against the immovable door, finally managing to force it open and escape into the night. We never spoke of that night to anyone, and the memory of the Thistledown Mill still haunts my dreams. The mill was more than an abandoned building. It was a place where the spirits of the past sought to communicate their dark secrets, and the line between reality and the supernatural blurred. The sinister whispers of the mill remain a chilling reminder that some places should remain lost to the sands of time. Seventh Story by Daniel Harrison Nestled deep within the rugged hills of West Virginia, Pine Hollow Mine had once been a thriving coal mine that fell into disrepair decades ago. The locals whispered of strange happenings in the abandoned tunnels, and tales of mysterious deaths had given the mine an ominous reputation. One summer night, my group of adventure-seeking friends and I decided to explore the abandoned mine, convinced that the stories were mere legends. We approached the mine entrance with trepidation, flashlights in hand, and a sense of unease grew with each step into the darkness. The mine's tunnels were a labyrinthine network of passageways, their walls stained with decades of soot and grime. The stale air was heavy with the oppressive weight of forgotten history. The silence was broken by the eerie echoes of our footsteps, and the distant sound of dripping water seemed like a faint, mournful melody. As we ventured deeper into the mine, the very walls themselves seemed to murmur with secrets, as if they yearned to share their tale of woe. It wasn't long before we heard it, the sound of whispering voices echoing through the tunnels. The voices were hushed, their words indecipherable, but their presence sent a shiver down our spines. We searched for the source but found nothing. The mine itself seemed to be alive with secrets, and the voices were relentless. The voices led us to a chamber filled with ancient mining equipment and rusted tools. In the corner, a dim lantern flickered to life on its own, casting eerie shadows on the walls. The whispers in the room grew more intense, as if they were trying to convey something important. 
Then, the lantern extinguished, and the chamber plunged into darkness. Panic set in as we fumbled to relight our flashlights, but it was too late. In the inky blackness, we heard the unmistakable sound of approaching footsteps. Our hearts pounded as the footsteps drew nearer, and the voices grew more frantic. A faint light emerged from the darkness, revealing the silhouette of a man clad in tattered miner's clothing. His face was hidden in the shadows, and his movements were disjointed, as if he were caught in a never-ending loop. He seemed to be reenacting the routine of a miner, picking up an invisible pickaxe and swinging it rhythmically. It was as if the mine itself had trapped his soul, forcing him to relive his final moments for all eternity. We couldn't tear our eyes away from the spectral miner, his actions growing more frenzied. The whispers reached a fevered pitch, and it felt as though the very mind was trying to communicate something profound to us. But what could it be? With great effort, we managed to tear ourselves away from the haunting scene and fled deeper into the mine, the footsteps and voices fading behind us. The tunnels seemed to stretch on endlessly, and the sense of being watched never left us. We eventually emerged from the mine, gasping for air, our bodies drenched in sweat. The Pine Hollow Mine held secrets far darker than we could have imagined, and the memory of that night serves as a chilling reminder that some places are best left undisturbed, lest they awaken the restless spirits of the past. Eighth Story by Charlotte Bennett In the remote coastal town of Whitewater Bay, Oregon, the stories of the abandoned Whispering Pines lighthouse were whispered in hushed tones. The lighthouse had stood tall for over a century, guiding ships safely through treacherous waters, but it had been abandoned for years. Rumors swirled about strange occurrences in and around the lighthouse, and one foggy evening, my friends and I set out to explore the enigmatic structure, determined to uncover the truth. The night was shrouded in mist as we approached the lighthouse, its silhouette looming ominously in the coastal darkness. The gravel path leading to the entrance was overgrown, and the very air felt charged with an eerie energy. The interior was a maze of narrow corridors and spiraling staircases, the walls adorned with old maritime charts and faded paintings. Our footsteps echoed through the empty spaces and the sensation of being watched never left us. It was on the third floor that we heard it, a faint, distant melody that seemed to emanate from the very walls of the lighthouse. The tune was mournful, tugging at our heartstrings, and its source remained elusive. We followed the melody, drawn deeper into the heart of the lighthouse. The music led us to a small, dimly lit room, at its center was a grand piano covered in a dusty white sheet. The melancholic melody continued to play, as if by an unseen hand. We exchanged bewildered glances, unable to explain the inexplicable. The room grew colder, and our breath formed misty clouds in the air. The haunting melody intensified, and the feeling of dread descended upon us. It was as if the very walls were echoing the sorrow of a forgotten past. As we strained to understand the music, a shadowy figure appeared beside the piano, its form vague and ethereal. It was a woman, her hair flowing like dark water, her eyes hollow and mournful. She glided towards the piano and began to play, her fingers moving with ghostly grace. The melody she played seemed to tell a tragic tale of love and loss, a tale that transcended time and space. It was as if the lighthouse itself held the memories of all the souls who had passed through its doors. Unable to tear our eyes away, we watched as the woman's playing grew more frantic, the melody reaching a heart-wrenching crescendo. The room seemed to vibrate with emotion and the lighthouse itself seemed to weep for the woman's sorrow. It was then that the woman's form dissipated, 
and the music ceased. The room returned to its eerie stillness, and we were left in stunned silence, unable to comprehend what we had just witnessed. With heavy hearts, we made our way out of the lighthouse, the fog outside seeming even thicker than before. The Whispering Pines lighthouse was more than just an abandoned structure. It was a place where the echoes of the past still reverberated, and where the spirits of those long gone sought to share their stories. The haunting melody of that night remained etched in our memories, a reminder that the secrets of the lighthouse would forever remain a part of the enigmatic Whitewater Bay. Ninth Story by William Turner The long-forgotten Weston Hills Mental Asylum stood as a dark, foreboding monolith on the outskirts of Boston, Massachusetts. Its history was tainted with tales of unspeakable horrors, and its desolate halls had been abandoned for decades. Despite the warnings and rumors, my group of friends and I were determined to explore the abandoned asylum, to unravel the mysteries that shrouded the institution. The night was bitterly cold as we approached the decaying asylum, its once white walls now tarnished by the relentless passage of time. The wind whispered through the overgrown trees, and the very air was thick with dread. Inside, the asylum was a labyrinth of decaying corridors and crumbling rooms, each with its own dark history. The atmosphere was oppressive, and the sound of our footsteps echoed ominously. As we ventured deeper into the asylum, the whispers began. Faint, distant voices, filled with anguish and torment, seemed to emanate from the very walls. We strained to understand the words, but they were elusive, as if carried on the wind. The whispers led us to a room bathed in an eerie, sickly light. In the center stood an old wooden wheelchair, its leather straps tattered and torn. The whispers grew louder, more frantic, and it felt as though the very walls were screaming their secrets. In the corner of the room, we found a dusty file cabinet, its drawers filled with the case histories of former patients. The stories within were harrowing, filled with accounts of suffering and despair. It was clear that the asylum had been a place of torment and madness. Just as we were about to leave the room, the wheelchair began to move on its own. It rolled across the floor, its wheels creaking and squeaking, as if propelled by an invisible force. Panic set in as we watched in horror, unable to explain the inexplicable. The whispers reached a fevered pitch, and the room seemed to come alive with the memories of those who had suffered within its walls. The wheelchair continued to move, its movements becoming more erratic, as if it were trying to convey a message. With trembling hands, we made our way out of the room, the whispers and the wheelchair fading behind us. The asylum's dark secrets remained hidden, but the memory of that night serves as a chilling reminder that some places are best left undisturbed, lest they awaken the tortured spirits of the past. Tenth Story by Olivia Anderson Off the coast of Hatteras Island in North Carolina, there lay a shipwreck shrouded in mystery. The vessel was known simply as the Phantom, a massive, ghostly wreck that had become a local legend. The stories told of eerie occurrences surrounding the ship, and one moonless night, my friends and I set out to explore the enigmatic remains. As we approached the wreck, its silhouette rose from the inky black waters like a specter from the past. The abandoned ship was surrounded by a dense, impenetrable fog that clung to the vessel, giving it an otherworldly aura. We climbed aboard, flashlights in hand, and ventured into the heart of the Phantom. The interior was a maze of dark, narrow corridors, its rusted walls coated in a fine layer of salt. The air was heavy with the scent of the sea, and our footsteps echoed ominously. As we delved deeper into the ship, we began to hear strange, ghostly sounds. The creaking of the time-worn ship seemed to mimic distant whispers 
and the wind outside the shipwreck added to the eerie chorus. It was as if the very vessel was trying to communicate with us. The sounds led us to a small cabin, its door hanging ajar. Inside, we found an old captain's logbook, filled with cryptic entries that hinted at a hidden treasure. The logbook spoke of a cursed voyage and an enigmatic artifact, but its pages were faded and difficult to decipher. Just as we were about to leave the cabin, a sudden, inexplicable cold breeze swept through the room, extinguishing our flashlights. Panic set in as we fumbled to relight them. In the darkness, we heard the faint, echoing footsteps of someone, or something, approaching. With our flashlights finally illuminating the room, we saw a shadowy figure standing at the cabin's entrance. The figure was clad in tattered, salt-stained clothing, and their face was hidden in darkness. They appeared to be pointing to the captain's logbook, as if urging us to uncover its secrets. Eleventh Story by Robert Johnson Nestled among the rolling hills of the English countryside, Greystone Manor had always been a place of mystique and dark legends. The sprawling, centuries-old mansion had been abandoned for generations, and the locals whispered of eerie occurrences and spectral apparitions. One overcast autumn evening, my group of friends and I, fueled by curiosity and a thirst for adventure, decided to explore the enigmatic manor, to uncover the truth behind the ghostly tales. The manor loomed before us, its ivy-covered walls and weathered stones telling a tale of centuries past. The ancient oaks that surrounded the mansion seemed to reach out as if to welcome us to the long-forgotten domain. We entered the manor, and the air was heavy with a damp, oppressive silence. The floors creaked underfoot, and the grand, decaying rooms held echoes of their former splendor. We treaded carefully, our flashlights cutting through the gloom. As we explored the manor, the silence was broken by the faint, distant sound of a mournful melody. It was a haunting tune, as if played on a centuries-old piano. The source remained elusive, and the music seemed to beckon us deeper into the heart of Greystone Manor. The melody led us to a grand ballroom, where a decaying grand piano stood in the center. The notes of the melody continued to play, the keys moving of their own accord. We watched in awe, unable to explain the inexplicable. The room grew colder, and a sudden gust of wind extinguished our flashlights. Panic set in as we fumbled to relight them. In the darkness, we felt an eerie presence surround us, as if unseen eyes were watching our every move. Just as we were about to leave the room, the music abruptly ceased, and the room returned to an eerie stillness. The grand piano stood silent, and a heavy sensation of foreboding enveloped us. We made our way out of the ballroom, our sense of unease growing. As we ventured deeper into the manor, the strange occurrences continued. Doors opened and closed on their own, and faint whispers seemed to follow us from room to room. The presence of an unseen force grew more palpable. The whispers led us to a small library, its shelves lined with ancient, leather-bound tomes. As we perused the titles, a chilling wind seemed to blow through the room, sending shivers down our spines. The books themselves seemed to whisper secrets, secrets we couldn't understand. With trembling hands we left the library, making our way to the manor's entrance. As we stepped outside, the oppressive silence of Greystone Manor faded, and the overcast sky cleared. The manor held secrets far more mysterious and haunting than we could have imagined. The eerie presence and the enigmatic melodies remained etched in our memories, a reminder that some places hold the echoes of centuries gone by, and their stories continue to be told in the whispers of the wind. The figure's presence sent shivers down our spines, but the urgency in their gestures compelled us to stay. We approached the logbook, 
and the figure vanished into thin air, leaving behind a frigid, empty room. The logbook's pages began to turn on their own, as if guided by an invisible hand. The cryptic entries came to life, revealing the tale of a doomed voyage, an ancient artifact, and the curse that had befallen the phantom. It was a tale of treacherous waters and lost souls, and the very shipwreck itself seemed to be a relic of that ill-fated journey. With the story revealed, we made our way off the phantom, the fog outside seeming to lift. The shipwreck held secrets far more haunting and mysterious than we could have ever imagined. The enigmatic figure and the cryptic logbook remained etched in our memories, a reminder that some legends are more than mere tales. They are the echoes of the past that continue to resonate through time. Thank you for sticking with us through the whole video. Also, I recommend you this video you see on screen, one of the scariest on my channel. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe and like this video. This helps me bring you more thrilling content every day. If this video sent shivers down your spine, let me know in the comments.